right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, coming to you as usual from San Diego. And just a short two hour plane ride away in Colorado is Andrew Johnson, who is a leadership development expert, educator, TEDx presenter, and ultra marathon runner. How are you doing, Andrew? That's quite, a, quite an intro there, John. Thank you. Doing well, my friend. Yeah. Well, so before we get into it, uh, uh, Andrew, just for our audience's edification, explain the difference between a regular marathon, which a lot of people will consider an ultra in its, uh, in its own right, and an ultra marathon. You bet. Pretty small difference there, John. Uh, uh, anything over 26.2 miles is really an ultra marathon. Um, so it could be, you know, a 30 mile run, 50, 50K, uh, but technically speaking, it's anything over 26.2. Wow, absolutely. And what we're gonna talk about today is uh, this whole idea of, uh, obviously you've been an expert on marathons and ultra marathons. It's about what, what marathons can teach us about work and life. So let's get just straight into it, Andrew. Like, what, what are some of the core lessons that we yeah. can take from marathon running yeah boy john i i i've often maintained that that the marathon uh and obviously the the ultra marathon distance the ultimate metaphor for life i mean i think a lot of things that we can glean from that type of endurance training are lessons and things that we can apply to to leadership to our professional careers to our personal careers um you know, a couple offhand, number one, I, I think is knowing your why, understanding your why, you know, for instance, uh, you know, in the marathon class that I taught when I was in higher ed, it was called change through challenge. Mm -hmm. And it, essentially in that class, you would go from couch potato to marathon completer in 22 weeks. And these were all non-athletes, non-athletes. Right. These were everything from the 19 year old single mom to the 62 year old CFO that was in this class. And uh, there was no homework in the class other than two things. Number one, you had to complete the marathon at the end of 22 mm -hmm. weeks. But the, the other homework assignment was the very first week of class. The very first week of the class, I had everybody write on a piece of paper and it could be a sentence or it could be a paragraph, however long. And it was simply this, why are you taking this class? And what's gonna keep you from quitting when you wanna quit? Because you will wanna quit. Week yeah. seven or week eight, when it's cold out and it's dark outside and it's 5 a.m. and that alarm goes off and it says you need to get out and train and every fiber in your body says, I need to stay in bed. What is that compelling reason that's going to get you out of bed and train? Because here's the thing, 80, 90% of the time, you're not going to want to train. And the only way you can complete the marathon, the only way you're going to be able to run 26.2 miles is if you do the work. And the only way you're going to be able to do that kind of work for that long is to have a big, scary, hairy, compelling why of why you're doing it. So I think that's probably one of the bigger ones. There's a few others that we can talk about too, but I would say that's probably one of the, one of the big ones. Yeah. And, and I think that's a fascinating one because I do think, uh, I do think when it comes to work as a lot of people and probably to life too, is a lot yeah. of people have never really figured out the why and I think that's what causes a lot of angst and, and problems in work and in life is that when the going gets tough, as you say, is that you don't have that to fall back on because you've never really explored what your why is. Absolutely. I mean, we're, you know, there's a saying here, you know, that human beings are great starters and we're lousy finishers. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely true. And you need to think about times maybe in your own life, you, you know, either personally or professionally, those times where you really, really were able to get through situations that you never thought you'd be able to get through. A lot of times there was a, a compelling reason. Maybe it was your kids, right? Uh, I mean, some of the, the things that I heard from students when I gave them that assignment, you know, why are you taking this class and what's going to keep you from quitting when you want to quit? I mean, I heard things like, you know, my dad told me that I would never amount to anything, you know, and I'm going to prove him right or prove them wrong, right? Uh, you know, maybe it was a health issue. You know, my doctor told me if I don't get in shape, uh, I'm not going to be able to see my grandkids. I mean, things that are, that are really hitting at the core. Um, it's amazing when you have that big compelling why, uh, what, what you're able to, what you're able to do. 
Yeah, and that's why I think it's in, it's incredibly important for people to do that, like for their work and life, because let's face it, uh, you're going to be faced with a lot of adversities along the way. You're going to be faced in situations where you know things aren't going your way, or when you, as you said, on a cold, dank morning where you have to drag yourself out of bed. If you don't, if you don't explore what that is, um, you know, you're doing yourself a real disservice, and those to those around you, because maybe you're not doing the maybe you're not doing the right thing for yourself right now, and all you're doing is making yourself and everyone else miserable. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, you think about, you know, entrepreneurship, you know, people that are, that are out there in your audience, you know, that are maybe starting a mm -hmm. business or they're, they're in the throes of it. I mean, seldom is it a straight line from beginning to success. A lot of times that that path to success is, is littered with, with setbacks and failures. And again, you, you got to have a compelling reason to keep going uh, when, when the times get tough and it will get tough. It will get mm -hmm. tough. Uh, you know, another, another, Another key tenant I think that we that that the class teaches about not just training but but life in general is the uh, the power of consistency. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, we had a, a mantra. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, my, my students would get sick of me saying it, but we we said it over and over and over again. That, and it was simply this: it's not about the occasional big things; it's about doing the consistent small things. You know, things mm -hmm. like drinking water all day long, five small healthy meals, training four days a week, getting seven hours of sleep. I mean, that's really what it takes to, to, to train for a marathon or, or, or an ultra marathon. Uh, there's not a whole lot of big things, but again, it's a bunch of small little things done consistently over time on the days you yeah. don't feel like doing it. Uh, so I think the power of consistency is, is another key uh, key virtue that, that distance yeah. training teaches us. And and, and, I, and, and I like that particularly because, uh, you know, we live in this strange shortcut culture today where, you know, people oh want instant, instant gratification and all of that. But real success, as you yeah. said, it comes from consistently doing a lot of different things. It's that whole flywheel concept, right? You have to consistently Truly. be pushing it and doing more things. And eventually you'll get there. But it, uh, I 100% I agree with you. I think it's the consistently doing all of these things, a lot of things that you don't want to do. I mean, again, consistency, sometimes it, consistency, it's, it sometimes is routine and rote and you don't want to do it. But you know what? It's the combination of all of those things that's going to deliver the success. Yeah, you know, a absolutely. A absolutely there, John. In fact, I I'd love to take what you just said and just play a tape and repeat that over and over because it is so true. Um, you know, in, in the, uh, the leadership training, you know, we do here at, at Global Medical Response, we uh, at, at the beginning of class, you know, in the leadership training, uh, we just hit it right out immediately that, hey, gang, you know what, there are no silver bullets to becoming a great leader. There's not one thing you can say or one thing that you can do to build loyalty. Uh, in fact, we use the, 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 the marathon analogy. It's, it's a bunch of small little things done over time that show your people that they care or that you care. Uh, again, there's no silver bullet, uh, mm -hmm. but there's a bunch of small little tiny bullets done consistently over time. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and I think and another again, thing- I think that whole, that whole consistency principle applies. Yeah. And I think another thing is you probably agree, I think sometimes people get hung up. So they'll say, OK, I want to run a marathon. Great, great, great that you want to run a marathon. Yep. And then they'll sit there and they'll go oh, 26 miles or 26.2 miles. How am I ever going to do that? And they talk themselves out of it and they don't realize that, yes, set the goal to run a marathon. Oh, but then okay. but then scale it back. And let's see, the first step is maybe to be able to run a mile and not fall over. Boy, you know what, John? You hit a another big another big virtue that I think distance training teaches. Uh, in fact, I think back to the first time I read ran the uh, Leadville Silver Rush 50. Uh, you know, it's a 50 mile trail run at 10,000 feet in Leadville, Colorado. Starts at 10,000 feet and goes up to 12,000 feet and whatnot. And one of the questions that that I've been asked a number of times is, how do you run 50 miles? And the first thing I tell people is, number one is you never say, I'm running 50 miles, never, ever. And, and here's the thing, you know, there's seven aid stations in this race, about every seven miles. 
So what you tell yourself is you say, I'm just going to go seven miles and hit the aid station. And then I'm going to do it again. And then I'm going to do it again. And if you add up enough aid stations, guess what? You'll get to the finish line. And, and I tell you what I have just found, John, personally and professionally, that that mindset, uh, that analogy applies to so many things. You're, you're approaching a, a, a task, something at work, or you're opening a business or whatever you think, oh my God, how am I ever going to do this? And as you just said, it's taking that first step. It's eating that, you know, the whole notion of eating the elephant one bite at a time uh, applies in distance training. Absolutely. And it uh, applies in life. Yeah, and and we've had on this uh, on this show before is uh, a a uh, a luge right um, somebody who who has done the luge in the Olympics in the Winter Olympics uh, and an Argentinian gentleman, fantastic guy. But he said his whole his whole approach changed when he used to he used to focus be so nervous and focus about getting to the end of the run, and it wasn't until a, I think a German coach said to him you've got to stop focusing on the end of the run. You've got to focus on the next turn only. That's it. Absolutely. Then it, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's sort of this interesting dichotomy, I guess would maybe be the word, you know, yeah, you, you, you want to focus, you, you, you want to reach the goal and the goal is important, but on, on the other hand, you, you sort of have to let go of that goal. Yeah. And and you just have to just get focused and just just get to the next aid station. It really is the it really is true. Yeah. And then the, another question about um, about the marathon. I think that 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 is fascinating and the analogies you can draw from it. So not having run a marathon, I'm just just a disclaimer here. I have not run a marathon. I can imagine what it's like. I've done a few yeah. distance runs, not quite the marathon. Um, um, martial arts is more my thing, um, but. Uh, I'm sure Next. there is, I'm sure there is a point, there's always a point, I'm sure, maybe there's a number of points, but there's got to be a point in, in maybe in your first marathon, your first couple of marathons, where you reach that point where you just go, I can't, I can't keep going, I, 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 it's just too much. How do you get yourself over that hump and what can you learn for life and business? Oh, boy. Yeah, you know, in the marathon, they call it the wall, you know, it's typically mm -hmm. uh, about mile 20 where your body physically is spent and you still got six more miles, six more miles left. And that's absolutely true in the, uh, the ultra marathon. In fact, the ultra marathon, typical ultra marathon, you might hit that wall uh, a number of times. And, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, I think you, you focusing on that, why understanding, you know, reminding yourself, why am I doing this? Right. That I, I think have, having that compelling why is, is super important. Um, but what I have found also is, uh, again, this is where maybe that peer support is super important. I remember uh, doing the, the very first time doing the Leadville Silver Rush 50. I remember at mile 35, was at, I was completely spent, completely spent. And uh, I ran across a school teacher and, and uh, he was suffering too. In fact, he looked worse than me. And uh, I remember I had a little Snickers bar uh, in my hand and uh, I offered him my Snickers bar and he said you know I really don't want that Snickers bar I said I didn't ask you if you wanted it I said you need to eat the Snickers bar because you look worse than me my friend and he thought that was pretty funny and uh, needless to say that that little interaction we uh, we started talking to each other and uh, him and I ran the rest of that not ran again you don't run an ultra marathon by the way most of the time it's mostly a long day hike him and I uh, went those last 15 miles together and uh, I look back on that there, John, I don't know if I could have finished that race successfully without him. I don't know if he could have without me too. And so I think that peer support, helping others uh, and being an influence on someone else. And to me, that's one of the most beautiful things about endurance training is that virtue. But uh, uh, having that, that peer support and relying on others uh, is super huge. Yeah, I, you know, I, I love that. I think that's such a fantastic um, example and analogy because, uh, you know, when the, when the going gets tough and we hit our walls, whether it's, yeah. you know, professionally or personally, we can get very, very self-absorbed and self-pitying and undermine ourselves. And what you just outlined there is turning around and realizing 
Yeah, it may be our journey, but there's other people on this journey too or on similar journeys. And when you reach out to help and to interact with those other people, suddenly it's a shared burden. Boy, amen to that, John. I mean, here, here's the thing, you know, and, and on any kind of professional or personal challenge, again, professionally or personally, uh, seldom is going it alone the wisest thing. I mean, there's other people who've gone through what you're going. Lean, lean on that. Have that, you know, build that network. That peer support is so crucial. And, um, you know, that emotional support, that technical support, super huge to have, uh, to have peers. And, um, you know, by the way, I, I, you know, I should add, uh, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, doing marathons, ultra marathons, I have failed as often as I have succeeded. And I think that's another thing that you've learned. I've, I've dropped out of races before, uh, or I have missed the cutoff. And, uh, uh, you know, here's the thing. I think you learn from both sides of the ledger. I think you learn from, I mean, you learn from victory, no question, but, you know, I think failure also leaves as many clues as, as success a lot of times. And I think we learn from, from both sides of the ledger. So. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you raised that because I do think sometimes that we have a tendency to look at only the success stories and we think even, oh. you know, in, in business and sport and anything, you know, we see the success of the person today and we just assume that it, they, it happened for them. What we don't see it's is, got- yeah, we don't see the times that they fail. We don't see the times. We don't see the people who are going to be who are the people who are dropping out right now who are actually going to be successful in the future because this is part of the process we go through. So I think the important lesson here is so, so t- tell me this. The first time when you had to drop out or you missed the cut, how did you stop that being a, you know, being something that kind of put you off totally or said, okay, I'm done with this. This is, I'm, I'm going to do something else. What, what, how did you take that and actually use that to drive you forward? Boy, you know, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, like with the Leadville Silver Rush 50, I mean, I've, uh, Let's see, I've been successful three times on that. And I think I've been unsuccessful twice. And I remember the, the first time just missing the cutoff. I mean, I, I, I crossed the finish line, but I made it after the cutoff. So it officially didn't count. And, uh, you know, I just kind of reframed it. And uh, I said, well, you know, it's not an official count here. But, you know, given what I was able to do, given the amount of training time I was able to put into it, I think I did all right. I said, you know, the other, the other way I looked at it is I said, you know, this was a beautiful day. It was 14 hours. It took me 14 and a half hours that day. You have 14 hours to do it. So it was 30 minutes after the cutoff. I said, I'm in one of the most beautiful parts of the nation. And I'm in just this amazing scenery here with all these fabulous people. And this is an amazing experience. People would give their eye teeth to be where I'm at here today. And if I'm going to complain, that I just crossed the finish line 30 minutes later, then shame on me. There's so much to be thankful here for this day. My body is letting me go 50 miles today. And uh, so, you know, thank God. And uh, so I think it's, I think it, you know, when you, when you hit failure, you have to reframe it sometimes and just say, okay, what did I learn? But what were the blessings from it? And, uh, you know, how do I take that to propel me so I come back stronger next time? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I love that. And, and also, you said the reframing and maybe saying, looking at it going, no, actually, I didn't, I didn't fail. I succeeded at all of these things. Okay, did I hit the overall goal? No, but next time I know what I need to do. But look at all the things I actually achieved today. Absolutely. You know, I tell you what, just maybe one other thing here, John, the, the thing that I love about like ultra marathon running, I mean, you think, oh my gosh, how does anybody go 50 miles or how does anybody go 30 miles? Quite honestly, honestly, the thing I love about this sport is it's, I think it's one of the few sports where you don't really need innate talent. I mean, it's, like I said before, it's essentially just a long day hike. I would say the, the thing that really makes for a successful marathon or ultra marathon runner or finisher is just the ability to grind, just the ability. Uh, in fact, I, I always say, I think my superpower is uh, I can just suffer a heck of a lot longer than most other people. And uh, I think just the ability to grind and keep going is probably the key skill uh, for this kind of endeavor. Yeah, there's a very famous, there's a, there's a very famous Irish historical patriot figure who uh, 
um, who once said, it's not um, back when there was the conflict with the English, he said, it's not those who can inflict the most pain who, who will ultimately be the victor, but those who can endure the most. Oh, love it. Love it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but just back to I, you. But know, back I to can't you. remember her name. Oh, oh my gosh. She's, uh, oh, boy, the name is escaping me. She was, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, anyway, Terence Maxweeney, if anybody's interested, uh, is the person who said that. Um, but, yeah. but I like what you were saying there. About, I love what you're saying there about the fact of, of you know, it being something that anybody could do. And, and I think that's a great, again, it's a great analogy because it's, it's sometimes we, we think that everything needs these, you know, you need to be born with these skills or it needs to come naturally to you or innate. And, and let's face it, the evidence yeah. out there in the world is of so many examples of people who didn't have innate skills, who didn't have anything particular that, yeah. that, that made them different, but they were able to achieve extraordinary things. And as you said, because they were willing to persist. Absolutely. Boy, uh, John, I can't, can't agree with you more. I mean, again, I, Maybe that's another virtue that 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 endurance training, that distance training teaches us is, you know, I mean, I think talent and I, I even hate to say it, education might be a little overrated. I mean, I'm a former educator, so I, I, mm -hmm. I, I believe highly in education, but uh, I think just being able to, to, to persist and, and push through and grind through uh, is just as valuable, if not more valuable than uh, than talent and education many times. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's true. And I think we've seen this in the last year with everything that's going on, uh, has gone on, is that um, resilience and, and the bill it, it, it's, it is a huge um, part of how you handle anything or your success. And I think it's an underrated, it's an underrated skill. And I also think in some ways, as we said at the very beginning, in this kind of shortcut, uh, instant gratification culture, the idea of sticking at things and actually working hard at them, maybe a little bit counter, maybe a bit counterculture right now, but hey, it's at the end of the day, these really. things all come back into vogue. And if people really examine those who have been successful, they'll see there's an awful lot of grind behind it. Well, I mean, it really is that simple. I mean, like, like you said, I mean, we're, yeah, we're looking for that quick fix, that silver bullet. And, uh, you know, anything that, that, that I think is worthwhile Seldom are there silver bullets. And, you know, as you sort of alluded to there, there's no secret complex formula. You don't need a lot of necessarily need a lot of talent, a lot of skill. Uh, but but it's that mindset of, 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 again, just persisting, grinding through. And, and as you mentioned there, you know, re resilience. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but we've had to change the way we've done business uh, dramatically. In fact, I don't know about you. I mean, here we are on, on Zoom. I didn't even know what Zoom was a year ago. <laughs> Right, and 90% of my business now is done on Zoom. And uh, I mean, talking about having to uh, to pivot and adapt and be resilient and and um, be resourceful, those are the key skills I think um, that are the that are the key things into this year and next year and and, and beyond. And I think those are those are always going to be skills that are going to be super critical in uh, in in any endeavor. Yeah, yeah, no, I I could agree, but it's a great place to end because I think you're you're 100 correct. I think that we're always, you know, as going forward, things change so dramatically so quickly. We've seen that in the last um, year. We've seen that with technological advances. We've seen that with what happened with the pandemic. Like life can change so fast. So adaptability, sure. resilience, the ability to to pivot, like you did with your business. I mean, the, these yeah. are the these are the, the I think these are the skills that you really need for the future to be successful. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, these are, you know, it's, it, it's interesting, you know, in the, the, the leadership training that we do at Global Medical Response, you know, it's uh, the, the things that we teach are, are kind of similar to this. It's, you know, we call them leadership skills, but in my opinion, a lot of these are life skills, things that apply, you know, just outside of the workplace, just to be successful in any endeavor. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. Okay, so uh, Andrew Johnson, thank you very much for today. The Athlete Coach, all of Andrew's information is going to be below the video. So I would uh, encourage you to check it out. But before we go, Andrew, just uh, tell us a moment about uh, a little bit more about yourself and what you do. You bet, you bet, John. Well, again, thanks for for having me on here and talk talk about something I love here. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm the director of uh, uh, leadership development for a uh, major uh, 
medical air and ground transport company do their leadership training. Uh, I also do uh, coaching on the side, executive coaching, mainly on the area of uh, fitness and performance. So uh, love what I do and, uh, and hope it shows. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the enthusiasm comes through very strongly. Uh, again, listen, thanks, Andrew. It's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating to learn about things like ultra marathons and just how those lessons can translate. Really? Yeah. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, John. Thank you.